Hello again, everyone. It's been a, a bit of time since we've had a sociology video on this page, but we're going to add a new one today. And the topic of this one is going to be on the founding fathers of sociology. So we're going to look at how sociology came to be as its own discipline, kind of the context behind that, as well as the ways in which the early sociologists impacted the study of sociology and how we continue to do it today. Also, I'm going to throw this out there right away. If anyone can get me this shirt, you'll be my best friend of all time and I'll give you some candy or something, but this shirt's awesome, so get it for me. Thanks in advance. All right, to our essential questions. We have two of them in this particular video. Why do people consider sociology a science? In other words, what makes a discipline a science? And we'll see that with sociology. And then second, how did early sociologists help define the science of sociology? So what kind of ideas, thoughts, concepts did they create that became the foundation for that discipline? So before we get into the actual fathers themselves, we need to look at how sociology became an educational discipline. Compared to other disciplines, especially in the social sciences, sociology is really young. In fact, we didn't start to see sociology emerge until 18th, the 18th and 19th centuries in Europe. Why might that be? Well, one major event, and hopefully you remember back to your world history days, but a major event in the history of mankind, especially in Europe, was the Industrial Revolution where we see a rise in a factory-based industrial economy. So we see factories, we see cities rising, which is this next one. We see all of these different things being created that create an entirely new society, especially with the creation of social inequalities. The third reason we start to see this emerge in the 18th and 19th centuries is because at this time there is an explosion of new ideas about democracy and political rights. Also thinking back to your world history, Think about the Enlightenment, this time when people were questioning absolute rule, and then also these, these pretty violent, oftentimes, social revolutions that changed the way a lot of people looked at society. So these are the origins of the science that we call sociology. But now we're going to take a look at the guys who really made it what it is. The first is this dashing gentleman right here. His name is August Comte. He was a French social thinker, and he's considered to be the, quote, father of sociology, mostly because he's the one who actually coined the term. Okay, when we talk about ologies, any kind of ology, biology, it's the study of something. And he, since there wasn't really anything like this at his time, he said, I want to study society. We'll call it sociology, the study of society. So we can, we can attribute that term to him. His big contribution to the field itself that we still see today is the idea of positivism, which is understanding society based on science. Comte believed that society has its own laws, much like the physical world has its own laws. Think about gravity and stuff like that. He says society operates in a very similar fashion. And other sociologists have disagreed with him, but this is a pretty key concept in creating the science of sociology. The other part about positivism, positivism is that we need to make sure that the knowledge we have is knowledge that we know for sure. In other words, we can be positive of it. So we can't really say something is true until we've found that it's, that it's true, which is a big component of science. Comte also studied something called social dynamics and along with that social statics, looking at two different things. First, how society changes, and then secondly, how society stays the same. And different sociologists look at different things. So how does order created and how, does, how do things change in our society? The second guy with the uh, awesome sideburns there is a guy named Herbert Spencer, very controversial figure in the study of sociology. He was an English sociologist. The big part that he said about how society is formed is that society is like the human body. Much like the human body has different parts, and all those parts work together to make the human being function, society has something very similar. The example he gives here is, just as the heart and eyes help body function, social institutions like religion, education, um, whatever it might be, help society function. So it is the sum of all these different parts, and they all work together. However, the thing that Spencer is most known for that's very controversial is his idea of social Darwinism. Hopefully you've heard of Darwin before, Charles Darwin, who studied the theory of evolution, especially with his finches in the Galapagos Islands. Herbert Spencer took that theory, and he kind of twisted it a little bit. It's kind of a distorted view of, of Darwin's theory, um, but he took natural selection, the idea that the, survive, the strongest will survive, things like that, uh, he, and he applied that to society. He applied that to people. All right? We call it social Darwinism. So he believed that the strongest members of a society should not help the weaker ones because the stronger ones are strong for a reason, the weaker ones are weak for a reason. 
So the rich deserve to be rich, the poor deserve to be poor. And if we have that, it creates a stronger society. We should let the sick, let the weak, let the homeless, the people in poverty, let those people go away because it makes our society as a whole stronger. So as you can probably imagine, this is a very controversial topic. The third one, I'm guessing you've heard of before in world history, uh, is a guy named Karl Marx. Grant, again, another great beard. He was a German economist, sociologist, among many other things. But as far as sociology goes, he's best known for looking at conflict in society. And he argued that no matter where you are in society, there is always some kind of struggle going on. And usually it has to do with valued resources, whether it's countries going to war, whether there's rivalries between schools, whether there's a fight between two people at school. Marx would look at all of that and say, look, our society is full of conflict everywhere we go. Specifically, he talked about class conflict. According to Marx, there were two social classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Okay, two kind of long, fancy words. But the proletariat, according to Marx, were the workers who sold their labor for wages. So they're the ones that worked in these new factories that were created in the Industrial Revolution. The bourgeoisie are the owners of those factories, the owners of those means of production. And Marx said that those two are always conflicting with each other and that they're never going to be able to get along. He actually predicted that eventually the proletariat would rise up and overthrow the bourgeoisie. The workers would overthrow the owners which is kind of the foundation for communism, which, again, is, is part of our modern world today, even though it's kind of gone away in, the, in the, the last 50 years or so. Marx also rejected the idea of individualism, which is a pretty significant concept. He called it false consciousness. Oftentimes, people blame individuals for the flaws of society, like there's some bad eggs or whatever it might be. Marx believed that the system itself should be considered the, the cause of social problems. The system, in other words, creates the problems, not the individuals themselves. And that's something we'll debate later on. Our next founding father uh, is a guy named here named Emile Durkheim. And he was a French sociologist credited with, and, and, and even though Comte is, is credited with the creation of the word sociology, Durkheim is really the one that's credited with making it an academic discipline, something that could be studied in schools, colleges, universities, whatever it might have been. And he believed that society exists beyond ourselves. And he has a famous quote here, to love society is to love something beyond us and something in ourselves. It's kind of a, a complicated quote, but when you break it down, it really makes sense. Durkheim said that society is beyond the individual. Society was here before we were here, any individuals were here. It shapes us while we are on this earth. And even after we die, long after we die, society can still continues to shape people's lives. So our personalities are created by the societies we live in. So that quote where it says something in ourselves, he argued that society is in us. It's part of who we are because it shaped our personalities. Okay, so it's beyond us, but it's also within us. He was also big on qualitative data collection. Uh, we'll talk more about this later on. Um, he was the first to use the scientific method to create sociological experiments. Okay, and we start to see data being collected to create social realities. For example, Durkheim spent a lot of his time studying the concept of suicide. And he tied that concept of suicide into another major concept that you definitely need to know. It's called social integration. Durkheim said that the degree to which an individual is connected to society will affect the self-destructive behaviors a person engages in. So if someone who has very weak social ties that person is far more likely to go through self-destructive behaviors, including suicide. He also looked at famous people, or we've, we've used his ideas to look at famous people um, and to see why famous people commit suicide. And if you take a look at the chart here, this is an example of quantitative data, how we use numbers in order to create social realities. For example, we see here that men have much higher suicide rates than women, and it also varies within their different race and ethnic groups. So that is something that Durkheim would have looked at, and we, help, we also use the quantitative data to help us figure that out. He also said that an individual's desires must be balanced by the guidance of a society. So there has to be a balance between what the individual wants and what society thinks is appropriate. And if you can't find that balance, which honestly it can be very hard to find sometimes, that's when you start to see very deviant behaviors, very evil people being created, those types of things. And lastly, but certainly not least, we have Max Weber, even though his 
Liam has a W, he's German, so he pronounced the W as a V. He was a German scholar and sociologist, and the big thing that he contributed to us is the idea of interpretive sociology. If you remember back, we talked about Comte, the idea that, that society was governed by laws, there were social laws. Weber kind of disagreed because he said that these realities are created by people themselves. And as sociologists, it's our job to figure out what those realities really mean. And unlike Durkheim, who was big on quantitative data, Weber used qualitative data, so more observation, looking at the people around you, looking at different social situations, and figuring out the construction that we've made in those particular areas. One of the most famous contributions he made to sociology is called Verstehen, which is a German word that basically translates into what we consider, you probably heard this phrase before, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Weber believed that in order to truly understand the people you're studying, in order to truly understand the social situation, you have to put yourself in that situation and immerse yourself in that particular situation. Only then, according to Verstehen, is when you realize the, the social realities that exist in those places. Finally, he created the idea of rationalization. Basically, rationalization is the idea that our society has shifted. And a lot of that is because of what happened in the Industrial Revolution. He says that modern society is based on the use of knowledge, reason, and planning, rather than what it used to be, which was tradition and superstition. Examples of this, if you think about it, people are willing to accept new technology in modern societies because we have this idea, this knowledge of what it can do, and the reason, the reasonable idea that whatever this technology is, is going to improve our lives. People who don't believe in rationalization would say, would be afraid of things like computers or cell phones because it would ruin the traditional ways of life. But rationalization, according to Weber, is what our society today is based on. Knowledge, reason, planning. Okay, and there you have it. Even though there are countless other individuals who have made really significant contributions to the field of sociology, these are the five that we are going to ask you to know going forward and the ones that really got this study going. Now that you've watched this video, make sure you've completed your chart. We also have the quiz on Schoology to take, uh, and you can take as many times as you need in order to show that you understand some of the key concepts from the video. Thanks, guys. Have a good one.